2020. As for the banquet, everything went off as planned and was brought to a successful conclusion without any slips being apparent to the guests. The Marquis' rude optimism was proof against all subtleties of misgiving. He himself was well satisfied, and he never dreamed that any of his guests might possibly feel otherwise. It was at such moments that his wife's dazzling wealth was brought home to him, as their subsequent conversation revealed. The prince and princess seem to have had a good time from beginning to end, wouldn't you say? The Marquis began. I think they went home quite happy, don't you? That goes without saying, replied the Marquis. Didn't His Highness the Prince deign to remark that he had not spent so delightful a day since the Emperor died? That's not the best way he could have phrased it, but I know what he meant. But still to go from mid-afternoon until late at night don't you think it might have been too tiring for some of them? No, no, not at all. You arranged things so cleverly, with a variety of diversions following one after the other, that it all flowed wonderfully well. I don't believe that our guests had a moment to spare in which they could have become weary. There wasn't anybody asleep during the film. Oh, no. They were all watching wide-eyed from beginning to end and following with the keenest interest. But, you know, that Sartoko is a tender-hearted girl. I did think the pictures were quite emotional, but she was the only one sufficiently moved to cry. Sartoko had, in fact, been crying uncontrollably throughout the show. The Marquis had noticed her tears when the lights were lit. Kyoaki made his way up to his room, worn out. He was wide awake, and sleep became impossible. He opened the window and imagined that the snapping turtles were gathering together just at that moment, lifting their metallic green heads above the dark surface of the pond to peer in his direction. Finally he rang the bell that summoned Inuma, who since graduating from night school was always home in the evening. On stepping into the room, Inuma needed no more than a single glance to realize that anger and frustration were contorting the face of the young master. In recent weeks he had gradually developed a certain skill in reading facial expressions, a talent that until recently had been totally beyond him. He had become especially adept with Kyoaki, with whom he had daily contact and whose expressions reminded him of the whirling fragments of colored glass that settled into continually changing patterns within a kaleidoscope. As a result, his disposition and outlook began to alter. Not so long ago, the sight of his young master's face drawn in this way by anxiety and grief would have filled him with loathing for what he would have judged to be Kiyoka's sluggish indolence. But now he was able to see it as a refinement. Joy and exuberance did not, in fact, suit Kiyoaki. His beauty had a melancholy cast and so appeared most attractive when he was under the stress of anger or grief and together with these there was always a forlorn suggestion of the spoiled child as a kind of shadow image. At times like this his pale cheeks became still whiter, his beautiful eyes bloodshot, his finely arched eyebrows were twisted into a frown, and his whole spirit seemed to waver as though his inner world were shattered. He seemed desperately to need something to cling to. And so the hint of sweetness lingered in the midst of his desolation, like the echo of a song over a barren waste. Since Kyoaki said nothing, Inuma sat down on the chair he had made a habit of using recently even when Kyoaki did not offer it to him. Then he reached out and began to read the banquet menu, which Kyoaki had thrown down on the table. The dishes listed constituted a feast such as Inuma knew he would never taste, no matter how many decades he might serve the Matsugais. The evening banquet of the Cherry Blossom Festival. April the 6th. 1913. The second year of the Taisho era. Soup. Turtle soup finely chopped turtle meat floating in broth. Chicken soup broth with thin slices of chicken. Entrees. Poached trout prepared in white wine and milk. Roast fillet of beef prepared with steamed mushrooms. Roast quail stuffed with mushrooms. Broiled fillet of mutton garnished with celery. Parte de foie gras served with assortment of cold fowl and sliced pineapple in iced wine. Roast game ecoque stuffed with mushrooms. Individual salads. Vegetables. Asparagus green beans. Prepared with cheese. Desserts. French custard petits fours. 
I scream a choice of flavors. While Inum read the menu, Kyoaki kept staring at him, one expression succeeding another on his face. One moment his eyes seemed full of contempt, the next brimming with pathetic appeal. He was irritated that Inuma should sit there with insensitive deference just waiting for him to break the silence. If only Inuma had been capable of forgetting the master-retainer relationship at that moment, and had put his hand on Kyoka's shoulder like an elder brother, how easily he could have started to talk. He had no idea that the young man who sat in front of him was different from the Inuma to whom he was accustomed. What he did not realize was that the Inuma who had once been obsessed with the rough suppression of his own passions had now developed a gentle forbearance toward him, and, inexperienced as he was, had taken his first tentative steps into the world of subtle emotions. I can hardly imagine that you have least idea what's on my mind, Kyoaki said at last. Miss Artoko insulted me terribly. She spoke to me as if I were a mere child. And she as much as said that in everything up to now I've behaved like a foolish little boy. No, in fact she said it in so many words. She came at me with everything that would hurt me most, as though she had had it all carefully planned. I just don't understand how she could have brought herself to do it. Now I realize that the ride that snowy morning, which was her idea, now I know that I was nothing more than a toy she felt like playing with. Kyoaki paused for a moment. But you had no inkling at all of how things really stood. Tachina, for example, didn't say anything at all that sounded suspicious. Inuma thought for a while before answering. Well, no, sir. I haven't heard anything. But his awkward pause clung to Kyoka's nerves like a vine. You're lying. You do know something. No, sir, I don't. Finally, however, under the pressure of Kyoka's questions, Inuma poured out what he had been determined not to reveal. Being able to sense a man's mood is one thing, but to gauge his probable reaction is quite another. He did not realize that his words would strike Kyoaki with the force of an axe. This is what mine told me, sir. I'm the only one she told, and I promised faithfully not to breathe a word of it to anyone else. But since it concerns the young master, I think it's best that I tell it. It was on the day of the New Year's family party, when Miss Ayakura was here at the house. It's the day your father the Marquis is kind enough to invite all your relatives' children here to entertain them, talk to them and listen to their problems, as you know. And so it came about that your father the Marquis asked Miss Ayakura in a joking way if she didn't have any problems she wanted to discuss with him. She answered, also apparently as a joke, yes. As a matter of fact I have a very serious matter I want to discuss with you, Mark E. Matsuge. I wonder if I might inquire about your views on education. At this point I must tell you, sir, that this entire incident was related to mine by the Marquis as, well, a so-called bedtime story. These two words cost an Uma inexpressible pain and so he told it to her in detail, like a bedtime story, laughing a great deal as he did so and so she told it to me just as he said it happened. At any rate, Miss Ayakura had caught the interest of your father the Marquis, and he asked, My views on education, you say? And then Miss Ayakura said, Well, according to what I've heard from Kyo, his father seems to be a great advocate of the empirical approach. He told me that you treated him to a guided tour of the world of Gaishas so that he could learn how best to conduct himself there. And Kyo seems to be very happy with the results, feeling that he's now quite a man. But really, Mark E. Matsuge, is it true that you champion the empirical method even at the expense of morality? I understand that the lady asked this awkward question with her usual effortlessness. He himself burst out laughing and then answered, What a difficult question. That's just the sort of thing these moral reform groups ask in their petitions to the diet. Well, if what Kyoaki said were true, I could muster something in my defense. But the truth is this, Kyo himself rejected just that very educational opportunity. As you know, he's a late bloomer, he's so fastidious, it's hard to believe he's my son. Certainly I asked him to come with me, 
but I hardly had time to open my mouth before he bristled and stalked off in a high dudgeon. But how amusing. Even though that's what actually happened, he's made up a story so as to have something to boast to you about. However, I'm pained to think that I've raised a boy who would mention the red light district to an aristocrat, no matter how close friends they are. I'll call him in now and let him know how proud I am of his behavior. It might persuade him to go out and have a fling at a geisha house. But Miss Ayakura pleaded with your father the Marquis and finally convinced him to give up such a rash idea. And she also made him promise to forget what she had told him. And so he refrained from mentioning it to anyone else out of respect for his word. But he finally told mine, laughing all the time and obviously very amused by the whole thing. But he gave her a strict warning not to say a word to anyone. Mine is a woman, of course, and so she couldn't keep it to herself, she finally told just me. I realized that the young master's honor was involved, so I threatened her in no uncertain terms, saying that if this story went any further, I would break off with her at once. She was so shaken by the way I said this that I don't think there's any danger of the tale spreading. As he listened to this account, Kyoaki became even paler. He was like a man who has been groping wildly in thick fog, striking his head on one obstacle after another, until the fog suddenly lifts about him to reveal a line of white marble columns. The amorphous worry that had enveloped him now assumed a shape that was perfectly clear. Despite her denial, Satoko had read his letter after all. It had of course dismayed her somewhat. But when she found out at the New Year's family party from the Marquis himself that it was a lie, she became ecstatic and exhilarated over her happiest New Year. Now he understood why she had opened her heart to him so passionately and so suddenly at the stable that day. And finally, her confidence at its highest, she had thus been sufficiently emboldened to invite him to go for that ride through the February snow. This revelation did not explain Sato Kostes today nor the severe tongue lashing she had given him. But it was abundantly clear to him that she was a liar from first to last, that she'd been laughing at him secretly from beginning to end. No matter how one might try to defend her, it was undeniable that she had taken a sadistic pleasure in his discomfiture. On the one hand, he thought bitterly, she accuses me of behaving like a child and on the other. How obvious it is that she has been behaving as though she wants me to remain that way forever. How shrewd she is. She gives the appearance of being a woman who needs to be dependent at the very moment when she's up to one of her unscrupulous tricks. She pretended to worship me, but she was really baby nursing. Overcome as he was by resentment, he did not pause to reflect that it was his letter that had been everything, that it was his lie that had initiated the train of events. All he could see was that his every misfortune sprang from Sartoko's treachery. She had wounded his pride at a stage in his life, the painful transition between boyhood and manhood when nothing was more precious to him. Though the affair itself would seem trifling to an adult as his father's laughter had so clearly demonstrated, it was a trifle that nevertheless bore upon his self-esteem, and for Kyoaki at 19, nothing was more delicate nor more vulnerable. Whether she realized this or not, she had trampled on it with an incredible lack of sensitivity. He felt sick with disgrace. Inuma watched his white face in the lengthening silence with compassion, but he didn't realize how punishing a blow he had just delivered. This handsome boy had never missed an opportunity to discomfit him, and now, without the least trace of revenge in his intentions, he had crushed Kyoaki. Furthermore, he had never felt anything so close to affection for him as at this moment, watching him sitting with his head bowed. His thoughts took a still gentler, more affectionate turn. He would help Kyoaki up and over to his bed. If the boy began to cry, he too would cry in sympathy. But when Kyoaki raised his head, his features were hard and set. There was no trace of tears. His cold, piercing glance banished all in Omas fantasies. All right, he said. You may go now. I'm going to bed. He got to his feet by himself and pushed Anuma toward.